back, everybody. We're going to talk here about hypokalemia. In other words, a low concentration of potassium in the serum, in the blood. Okay, so in this talk, um, and then in the next talk where I talk about hyperkalemia, I'm going to go into the various causes, but I'm not going to go into the treatment of each of those causes, of each of those underlying pathologies that can give rise to these potassium disturbances. Um, I talk about them in other videos. Um, so what we're going to be talking about here is, okay, you've got a lab and it says you have hypokalemia or hyperkalemia. Um, how do we figure out what the cause is? And I'm not going to go into how we treat each of those causes because I talk about those in other videos, and you can go back and watch those uh, if you want to know more about each of those causes. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos, and I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel, and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so this is just a general overview of potassium. Uh, potassium is very tightly regulated. The normal range is about three and a half to five and a half. So a very, very narrow range. For uh, comparison, sodium is 135 to 145. So a much wider range uh, for sodium, uh, whereas potassium is very tightly regulated. Now the symptoms of potassium imbalance are very nonspecific and they're actually pretty similar. So we're not going to really be relying so much on the symptoms of the potassium imbalance itself. We're going to be looking at the symptoms of possible underlying causes. Usually there will be hints on the history. So you'll wanna know the major causes of the potassium imbalances. Um, a commonly encountered symptom, I should say symptom, is muscle weakness, uh, but again, very nonspecific. Anytime you have a patient with a potassium imbalance, it's a very good idea to get an EKG. So some of the most important labs that you can get include a basic metabolic profile, looking at electrolytes. Maybe some of the others are disturbed. We really want to look at bicarb. We want to get serum, magnesium, and calcium. That's not included on the BMP. We want to get an EKG, as mentioned, and then you want to get uh, urine electrolytes and creatinine. So not enough to get a urine a analysis. You need to get urine electrolytes and creatinine as we're going to see why that's important. Now, the USMLE is going to want you to find the cause of the hypo or hyperkalemia and know how to treat the patient. Like I said, I'm not going to be going into the treatment of each and every single cause of hypo and hyperkalemia because there are a lot. Um, so, uh, really what we're going to be going over here is how to approach a patient who has a low potassium or in the next video, a high potassium. Um, and, uh, and then at that point, then you can treat. Um, now hypokalemia is usually due to GI or renal loss of potassium. Um, so that can be from vomiting, it can be through the use of diuretics, it can be hormonal, so something like Cushing syndrome or Kahn syndrome can do it. And then uh, I talked in a previous video about renal tubular acidosis, um, that can be a cause as well. And another thing that's useful to know is that severe hypokalemia, so under three, maybe under two and a half, um, that can actually induce rhabdomyolysis. And we'll see in the next video that rhabdomyolysis is a cause of hyperkalemia. So these are the various causes of hypokalemia. There are a lot, uh, but you can see here that um, there, are, uh, um, there are some that will present with high blood pressure, and there are some that will present with low blood pressure. There are some that present with an acidosis, some that present with an alkalosis. And so that's why um, getting that BMP is useful. Um, knowing the various hormones that can be implicated is useful because some can cause hypertension or hypotension and so forth. So um, very, very, very uh, important for you to know these causes, um, but we are going to go into the most common causes and the ones that you'll probably run into on your exam.
So here are some hints. Um, if the urine potassium is high, then naturally you need to think of renal losses. Usually we measure this um, as a ratio, urine potassium divided by urine creatinine. Um, so if that urine potassium is high, that's inappropriate because we have a low serum potassium. So you would think of renal losses like diuretics, for instance. If the patient has hypertension, then you should think of a hyperadrenal state like Cushing or Kahn syndrome. Remember, Cushing is cortisol, Kahn is aldosterone, but both of them have mineralocorticoid activity. If there's a concomitant metabolic alkalosis, think of GI losses like vomiting. Uh, if there's a concomitant metabolic acidosis um, or there's growth retardation, you need to think of one of the renal tubular acidoses. If the patient is diabetic, then think possibly of hyperinsulinemia. Um, insulin drives potassium along with glucose into the cell so it can precipitate a hypokalemia. And then a family history. Uh, if the patient says, you know, yeah, my dad was seen for uh, low potassium like five times and my sister's been seen before, you might want to think of something congenital, but these are very rare. Barter syndrome, for instance, is one in a million. So these are pretty rare, um, but they do come up uh, particularly on step one. Now here is a, an algorithm that you can use. Um, and what you can see here is we have uh, on the left, we have extra renal losses of potassium. And you know that it's extra renal because the urine potassium is relatively low. Uh, whereas here on the right, we have renal losses of potassium. And that's um, we know that because the urine potassium is relatively high. So as you can see here, if it's extra renal, you're probably dealing with some sort of transcellular shift or a GI loss. Whereas if it's renal, uh, you're looking at the possibility of a metabolic alkalosis and you'll want to then know the blood pressure, whether you're dealing with activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, if you're dealing with ectopic aldosterone, ectopic cortisol, or if it's low um, and normal, you may be dealing with a response, for instance, to a metabolic alkalosis. Uh, metabolic acidosis can uh, cause this as well as when we were talking about the renal tubular acidoses. Remember that this here is going to be a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. All right, so GI losses, why? Well, vomiting is gonna cause a loss of acid that results in a metabolic alkalosis. And when you have a metabolic alkalosis, you're gonna preserve acid. So the nephron will reabsorb protons and that comes at the expense of potassium. So you will waste potassium. Um, a loss of fluid causes hypovolemia. That's going to increase aldosterone through the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is going to result in reabsorption of sodium and water, and that is going to be at the expense of potassium. It also raises ADH levels, which causes free water reabsorption, and that can also lead to a hyponatremia. So if you're looking at a hyponatremic, hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis, you are likely dealing with uh, some sort of GI loss, usually vomiting, and you should know what metabolic alkalosis looks like on your labs. Usually this is evident by history. Make sure and consider your various differentials for vomiting, usually gastroenteritis, but you can think of things like alcoholism, vertigo, bulimia, and so forth, just based on the patient's presentation. Most of these patients will need volume resuscitation. If a patient comes into the ER and they've been vomiting, it's good to bolus them. Other causes of GI loss are listed here. Bowel prep, sodium phosphate uh, solutions are a common cause of hypokalemia. Diuretics, uh, basically what's happening here is you're inhibiting either the NKCC channel uh, through loop diuretics or the NACL symporter through thiazide diuretics. It increases the amount of sodium that's presented to the collecting duct. That sodium is reabsorbed at the expense of potassium. This is a common problem. However, most of these patients are going to be low normal or maybe just mildly low potassium. Uh, so in most cases, we do not need to treat this. It only needs to be addressed if symptoms are present. Uh, hyperadrenalism. Why does this happen? Well, aldosterone is going to trigger the reuptake of sodium in exchange for potassium and acid. 
Now, cortisol also has mineralocorticoid activity, so it pretty much works the same way. Primary hyperaldosteronism is the most common cause of secondary hypertension. I'm going to have a video on hypertension that's going to be coming out shortly, um, so that's important to know. What do we see in these patients? Well, because we're dealing with high levels of aldosterone, we're going to be kicking out potassium into the urine and we're going to be pulling in sodium. So for that reason, we're going to have a hypertension with this hypokalemia. Now, a couple causes of hyperadrenalism. Cushing syndrome causes excess cortisol, usually uh, due to an ACTH secreting adenoma, which would be Cushing's disease, uh, or it can be due to a cortisol secreting adenoma in the adrenal gland itself. Uh, remember that these patients are going to have those stereotypical hypercortisol features, weight gain, moon facies, buffalo hump, purple striae, and so forth. I got a picture of that I'll show you in a little bit. Con syndrome is due to excess aldosterone directly, so you'll have the same clinical presentation minus those uh, hypercortisol symptoms like the weight gain and so forth. Renal artery stenosis will activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which will also give you hyperaldosteronism. Here's Cushing syndrome. You can see the moon facies here. And then you can see the purple striae and the buffalo hump. Hyperinsulinemia uh, would cause hypokalemia because it brings both glucose and potassium into the cells. Remember when we're dealing with DKA, which is the opposite, where we don't have enough insulin? Potassium will collect in the serum, cause a hyperkalemia. However, the overall body stores of potassium uh, is actually quite low. So that's part of our management for DKA. But if we have a high level of insulin in the blood, we're going to be drawing potassium into the cells and cause a hypokalemia. So what you'll look for here is a hypokalemia with a low blood glucose. And a lot of times these patients are, uh, they have insulin prescribed to them, so they may take too much insulin or they may um, be taking insulin on purpose uh, to, uh, as, as part of a factitious disorder. Uh, a useful thing to know if you have a patient with hypoglycemia, high levels of insulin, uh, what you want to do is get a C-peptide level. C-peptide is a marker for endogenous insulin. So if the C-peptide is low relative to the insulin, then you know that this insulin is coming from outside the body. Whereas if the C-peptide is also elevated, then you know this is endogenous insulin. And your next step then would be to look for an insulinoma, get a CT, look at the pancreas, see if you find any masses. Uh, one more thing I'll bring up is that this kind of hypokalemia can occur during the treatment of DKA when we give these patients insulin. So it's always very important to make sure that you are supplementing them with potassium, keeping a very, very close eye on the potassium. If they become hypokalemic, we need to stop the insulin temporarily. Low magnesium is a possible cause of hypokalemia. Anytime the magnesium is low, it can cause disturbance of any of the electrolytes. Uh, so magnesium stabilizes the nephron and reduces urinary loss of potassium. If you have low magnesium, it can re result in increased urinary loss. Uh, so Suspect hypomagnesemia when you have a patient with hypokalemia, you give them potassium, but this just does not get better. That uh, really points to hypomagnesemia. That's why it's very useful to get that serum calcium and serum magnesium uh, when you're working these patients up. Now, if you get an EKG, what you'll see with hypokalemia is T-wave inversion. Um, this is kind of a nice little mnemonic to help you remember that. You can also see a prominent U-wave. And then you can also, in severe cases, uh, you can get a QT prolongation, and that can lead to torsade. Okay, so you notice here, and this is just looking at the precordial leads, the T waves are very, very, very subtle, and uh, in many of these, you'll have a U wave too. So here you can actually see the T wave, and then here's the U wave right here. Uh, but if you look at V4 through V6, uh, you don't really see a T wave at all. Uh, that might be a little T wave there and a little U wave there. So look for the flattened T wave, could be even inverted, and then look for the U wave as well. This is torsade. This is the, the feared complication of a prolonged uh, QT interval.
to manage these patients, make sure you get an EKG, serum magnesium if you haven't already done it, and then other labs depending on the suspected etiology. You don't always need to do other labs though. Make sure and discontinue any potentially offending drug. Um, that would be probably something like a diuretic. Uh, replace the potassium. If they're asymptomatic and able to tolerate it, just give them oral potassium chloride. If they're symptomatic or unable to tolerate, let's say they're vomiting a lot, uh, then you'll do it IV. Be very, very careful though. Replenish the magnesium. If it is low, you can do that either orally or IV, same indications. And if they have severe hypokalemia, then you need to admit them. Make sure they're on continuous cardiac monitoring because they're at risk for uh, an arrhythmia and then get ser serial potassium levels to monitor their response to treatment. <laughs>